good afternoon and uh, welcome uh, to the SDI summit. It's the first day of our uh, summit. Uh, we're broadcasting here from uh, Geneva and the Sustainable Development Impact Summit uh, is now uh, going to uh, take place in the forthcoming days and at uh, opening day we have a great panel here today with us looking at how we can make sure that the recovery that we are now seeing is uh, more inclusive and sustainable and job creating uh, than what we saw before the pandemic. But let's face it, we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, we know that COVID-19 is uh, still around. We know that uh, many economies will be back uh, by the end of this year in a pre-COVID level. But many economies will only recover back to a pre-COVID level uh, in 2023 and 24. And uh, there are challenges. There is inflation. There is also, uh, of course, now a situation where a lot of the fiscal muscles are used. We put 13 trillion US dollars on the table. So if you're going to achieve uh, also progress in the years to come, we really need uh, public private partnerships and initiatives and collaboration because many governments will not have the necessary fiscal uh, muscles. The great panel here, as I mentioned, uh, we have um, Mohammed Al-Jadam, he's the um, finance minister of uh, Saudi Arabia. We have Vicky Holub, she is the president and CEO of uh, Occidental. We have N.K. Singh, and N.K. is one of the experienced um, leaders from India and currently the chairman of Finance Commission of India. We have Rich uh, Lesser, he is the CEO of uh, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, and taking over as the chair now uh, in October. And we have George Oliver, chairman and CEO of Johnson uh, Control. So, this is going to be a very important discussion uh, now at the first day of our summit. Let me uh, go first uh, to you, Minister uh, al -Jadam. Uh You also headed uh, the successful G20 presidency on behalf of uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, you were also focusing on the developing uh, countries that are now uh, in uh, quite a vulnerable situation uh, post uh, or following uh, the pandemic. At the same time, we are now focusing on how making sure that this uh, recovery will be more inclusive and sustainable. So it would be interesting to hear from you, Minister, at the start here. How optimistic are you about the recovery? When is it really uh, going to happen? Are we going to run out of speed when the... Um, money that we put on uh, the table now for stimulus uh, is uh, running out and how can we walk the talk making sure that uh, we secure more inclusiveness, sustainability and uh, jobs uh, for the young people uh, following uh, the pandemic. Over to you in Riyadh and thank you for joining. Thank you, thank you very much and thank you for the fantastic panel uh, in front of me. Uh, Borke, I think you, you mentioned a couple of very important, important points. And uh, to start with, and to answer the questions very directly, I am optimistic. And I think, yes, we will have overall globally uh, a very healthy recovery. Uh, that said, it is not going to be uh, equal recovery, and it is not going to be equitable recovery. There are a lot of issues that we need to deal with, and we need to learn from uh, the pandemic. <laughs> the pandemic told us very clearly that if we don't fix the world, you are not safe in an individual country. And uh, if you look at the uh, emerging markets, their uh, opportunity for a, a sustainable growth in the very few years to come are going to be very difficult and challenging without dealing with A, the pandemic. And we need really to focus on, on you know, fighting the pandemic with bringing our kids to school because that will really, really bring them back and, and compensate for the lost opportunities. A lot of kids around the world, like Dili in Saudi Arabia, people in the third grade today had only been in school for possibly two or three months in the last two years. 
Um, we are now back to school, and I think it is an area where we need to focus. So it brings a very clear signal that the world is back and is recovering. But also, we need to focus on equitable distribution and of vaccines, and and that is a very serious area where governments and private sector will need to come together to make sure that we deal with the bottlenecks of uh, vaccine production and allow the emerging markets who does not have access um, to vaccines to be uh, given that opportunity. I think we also need to deal with, um, as a, another lesson learned from, from this crisis, is that you cannot have one size fits all solutions. You need to deal with countries, specific circumstances, and and really, really focus on that. Uh, we need to continue the efforts that um, G20 have uh, endorsed last year in terms of the GSSI, in terms of the framework, the common framework, and dealing with sustainable debts uh, at low-income countries. That's an area where we really need to focus on. We need to get the private sector also uh, participate. Um, and I will close um, Borge uh, very specifically on the circular carbon economy and the issues that possibly even before we started in the background of this discussion, uh, renewables are a great thing to have. And I could tell you, even though we are the most possible producers and exporters of oil, we are focusing on renewables, but renewables is not the only solution. I think we need to focus and invest in technologies, research and development, and carbon capture, reuse, so that we deal with it at a very wide uh, level. Thank you, Borg. No, thank you, Minister. I think this is a great segue into also uh, Vicky Holub, uh, CEO and President of Occidental. You heard the Minister uh, talking about uh, renewables, of course, but also having a bridge between uh, today's energy mix and uh, the future energy mix. At the same time, we know that there are close to 800 million people in the world that doesn't even have access uh, to basic electricity. So how do we square this circle moving forward? Well, first of all, let me say, I'm glad to be a part of this forum because it's forums like this that are going to help us advance to where we need to be. And certainly where we need to be in the world is to provide um, low cost electricity for those places in the world that don't have it right now. We need to get a better balance across all of the world for quality of life. And for, for quality of life, uh, certainly electricity power is going to be necessary, but it has to be um, a, an affordable cost of energy. So to me, that puts the, uh, the pressure on the rest of us around the world to do the things that we need to do, especially in the developed economies, uh, with the U.S. being a, a specific focus for this, is to um, develop and help the transition out of fossil fuels by using technologies that help not only prevent um, emissions from existing sources, but to also remove, um, remove CO2 from the air because there's no doubt that we're going to need fossil fuels for a long time to come and, and longer than most people think, because fossil fuels will help to generate the low cost power for some of those places that don't have it today. So without a way to prevent um, the emissions happening from industrial sources in the developed economies today, and without the ability to take uh, CO2 directly from the air, we can't make that happen. And so, what we're trying to promote here at Occidental is this collaboration that's been talked about now in the film and, and from the minister, this collaboration that's so necessary for our world to get to where we need to be. And all we have to do is, is look at the incentives that were given to uh, solar, wind, and electric vehicles to see the, the case study for how to make that happen. And so I think that for the developing world and for those areas that most need it, we have to accelerate what we're doing with respect to CCUS, also as the minister suggested. CCUS has to happen, has to happen in a big way. Direct air capture has to happen. And uh, collaborating among uh, sectors um, and getting uh, more companies involved in this is going to help us get there. And I'm really optimistic because there are a lot more companies that are starting to show interest in doing this proactively uh, without mandates from governments. 
because the mandates won't get us there as fast as we need to get there. So it's it's the it's the companies that are committing to become a net zero by either 2040 or 2050. They're the drivers of what's going to be most important for the world to reduce uh, the emissions from where they are today, while not uh, impairing those uh, those people that don't have the lower cost electricity that will provide a quality of life that the rest of us enjoy. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rich Lesser, uh, the CEO of uh, BCG. I know a lot of companies now do come to you uh, to get advice. They want to go uh, then uh, CO2 uh, neutral by 2030 uh, or 2050. You listen to uh, what Minister Adradan said, also uh, what um, the CEO of Occidental now underlined, that also um, carbon has to be a part of uh, the solution, but then we new, also need new uh, technology. H how do you see the energy mix and uh, the opportunities then for a decoupling here between uh, growth and energy consumption and uh, CO2 emission? So, uh, well, first, uh, I would agree with Vicky. It's wonderful to get a, a group together to talk about these issues that span the public and private sector because we need cooperation across all sectors if we're going to make the progress that we need. Um, I just highlight a few things. The first is the encouraging, uh, there's two levels of encouragement that I would observe right now amidst massive challenge, which I do not want to diminish. The first is how much this has risen on the agenda of nearly every leader I talk to, whether in the public or in the private sector. It's not that this was unimportant three years ago or five years ago, but one would have thought post in, well, we're still sort of wrestling with the pandemic in many parts of the world, this might have fallen off the radar screen and it's just the opposite. For so many leaders, this is now one of the three or four core priorities that they're thinking about for their businesses looking ahead. The second thing from direct observation that we've had the privilege to have with now hundreds of clients is the opportunity to go further than people think they can in economically viable ways. That, that there was, a, I think many leaders started with the sense it's the right thing to do, but there's no way it's affordable to do. And it is true for most businesses to go all the way to net zero today is extraordinarily expensive. That last 20 to 40% of carbon that sits in the business is really hard to pull out. But what's very encouraging is the degree for many businesses to get 40 to 70% out relatively quickly and either in economically neutral to slightly positive ways um, and, and sometimes to actually make it so that you can then afford to take on the really hard parts, I think people are realizing they can go further faster than they thought and that's a really good sign. At the same time, the challenges are immense. First of all, 40 to 70 percent reductions aren't sufficient. We need to be getting as close to net zero as we can, as fast as we can. And in order to get that last chunk out, we will need a combination of technology, incentives, collaboration across sectors in order to drive that. Second, for most businesses, excluding the really upstream sectors like steel or aviation or aluminum, most sectors have most of their carbon emissions not inside their own operations, but in the operations of their upstream business partners. There's scope three in the in the parlance of, of uh, carbon language. And, and that requires tremendous operational skill to put the right measures in, to change the way we work with all our business partners, to have procurement weigh different things in the choices of who it works with and the incentives it sends uh, to be able to do that. And the final point is, um, for many parts of the world, the kind of transition we need is just not affordable, given all the other pressures they have to bring people out of poverty, to deal with immense near-term challenges. And in order to do that well, we need the developed world to step up more, to deliver on the $100 billion that was in the Paris Accords but has not really come through. Uh, it, we need better collaboration across country boundaries and better support. And we need to make sure that we're sending signals that we have to work together to make it a just transition at both the macro level in terms of flowing resources to those parts of the world and at the micro level as individual take as individual companies take action that could harm communities 
or not really bring people along in the kind of journeys that we need. So, so while there are signs of encouragement, we just have enormous challenges in order to make the progress at the speed we need to, given the urgency of this challenge. Well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Rich. Um, one company that is uh, really uh, walking the talk here in this area is Johnson uh, Control, uh, CEO and Chairman uh, George uh, Oliver. Um, the decarbonization that has to happen in the years to come also has to happen in our buildings. So maybe you can share uh, your vision there and how cost effective can it be? Can we make sure that the cost of uh, in action is uh, then, uh, I guess, uh, higher than the cost of action in this field. Yeah, Bo Borge, and uh, like, like Vicky and, and Rich, uh, I really appreciate you including us uh, on the, the panel. And I do believe that uh, businesses play a huge role uh, working with the public sector and making sure that we have an affordable supply of, of energy globally, that we drive economic development, um, and ultimately we decarbonize. And our view as it relates to buildings that you can do you can do all of that. And uh, we believe that decarbonization in the built environments, the role in, in, is, is a big role in shaping the economic recovery. So the transitioning to a lower carbon economy, we believe is an opportunity to build back better as we recover from the pandemic, uh, providing clean, sustainable, uh, energy efficient solutions creates jobs while we're building strong, resilient global economies. And while we're doing that, it's important for us um, that we ensure all communities and workers benefit um, from the transition to a clean energy economy. And we believe, I, I agree with Rich, I think the forces that are underway and the way that this has come together to be a prioritization for all of our constituents is uh, this year has been a critical year for climate action. Well, I think as you have stated, science shows that we need to move faster to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And I believe, as, as Rich has said, that not only through incentives, but also the technologies that are that exist today, as well as being developed, I believe puts us solidly on a pathway to net zero by 2050. And now we know that decarbonization, when you look at buildings, is part of the solution, as buildings represent some 40% of global emissions, and reducing the energy waste from building buildings not only saves money, um, but also a reason to there's every reason to accelerate action and to empower customers and future generations, uh, ultimately to consume less energy, conserve resources and identify pathways to achieve healthy net zero carbon buildings in communities. We talked a little bit about public uh, private partnerships and financing mechanisms. And, you know, I agree with Vicki, the, I believe the business community has an important responsibility to support ambitious climate change and policy and create jobs and economic growth. But, we ultimately can't do it alone. Uh, we realize how important it is to collaborate with all of our stakeholders uh, in the public and private sectors. And we believe global policies funding, incentivizing and directly mandating decarbonized buildings as a good example, uh, which the in the US Biden's administration, their plan to retrofit all federal buildings and invest in broader decarbonization is a good example. And we're working to, working with all of our stakeholders to ensure that we have a constructive path ahead of these actions. And one of the things I'd also note, Borge, is that as we're doing this, you know, we're focusing on local communities that help them not only meet the decarbonization goals, but also ensure a sustainable recovery. A good, good example is projects like we did with the Housing Authority in the city of Pablo, Colorado, um, which where we've enabled decarbonization while ensuring an equi equitable recovery. With our partners, we actually built a solar garden for a housing authority that will generate uh, enough energy to power two, 2, 000, uh, 200 households an annually. And in addition to providing the clean energy to the community, the project actually provided hands-on solar training and employment opportunities for the local community. And the, the improved building efficiencies will directly support the community wellness while reducing the city's carbon footprint to create a greener, healthier environment. So I think, you know, three P's, public-private partnerships are an innovative uh, model that can accelerate the implementation of these decarbonization measures uh, by enabling the public sector to improve facilities without an upfront cost. And for us, we actually can create an economic return. We can go in, upgrade a building, make it healthier and safer, 
while we're reducing the energy consumed and ultimately de delivering payback through operational improvement because we can reduce it in, in operations 30, 40, 50 percent. And so we play a big role in reducing the demand at the same time that we're working with the supply to make sure that we're replacing the remaining demand with, with renewable supply that ultimately gets to a net zero, net zero um, a carbon solution. So I believe that working the way that we're working and providing outputs and being able to bring a full solution within the building, connecting not only what we do in HVAC, but all of the other building systems to connect all of that with automation. And then the data is what enables us to be able to have such a significant impact um, in the overall carbon consumed. So those are some of the thoughts that, that we have. And we've been on a journey working with the business roundtable with the, in, in the US, with the European roundtable and with WEF to be able to educate all of our constituents on what ultimately can be achieved and can, can play a big, big part of how we not only create economic, economic development at the same time while we're delivering on our decarbonization goals. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you for uh, your leadership um, in this uh, field. Uh, let's then uh, move uh, to uh, New Delhi. N.K. Singh uh, is one of the most experienced uh, civil servants, but also um, government leaders uh, in India and also happens to be an excellent economist. So I would like to pick your brain on some of the more uh, macro challenges, N.K., that we are faced with. We know that in the run-up to COP26 uh, in Glasgow, we all know that without uh, China and India on board, there will not be a new ambitious uh, deal. And we know that Secretary Kerry uh, just visited also India and discussed, uh, like, when can there be, for example, an ambition from India's side uh, to go net zero. At the same time, we know that uh, the pandemic hit India uh, in a rough way. Uh, you are no handling it. Economy is again uh, growing quite substantially, but we know there's a lot of pressing development issues also uh, facing uh, your country. So how do you, uh, what is your take on India's role now on the decarbonization and net zero global issue? And secondly, how do you uh, see uh, the next months when it comes to the uh, Indian economy? Are you out of the woods? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Boshe, thank you so much. It's a privilege to be part of this discussion with uh, such an eminent panelist. And uh, most of what the other panelists have said, I'm in total agreement uh, with them. Uh, I'll make my some of the remarks very brief, but let me begin by saying that uh, I agree uh, with you about the fiscal muscle. I will comment on that issue of the fiscal muscle with which you began, but also with the uh, remarks of the finance minister, he very sagaciously said that uh, uh, one size uh, doesn't fit all. And India would be a classic case of one size uh, not fitting all. This is because, as you rightly pointed out, that uh, we have gone through successive waves of the pandemic. It has been a sagacious act on the part of the leadership to balance issues of life or with issues of livelihood. Uh, the two are not uh, symmetric. What may be good for life uh, may or may not be good for livelihood. So a, a right mix in a manner which does enables the life to be protected and minimizes human hardship like uh, direct uh, benefit uh, issues, like uh, public distribution system being strengthened, like uh, employment guarantee schemes for rural areas. And all that has resulted uh, with a, a rather sharp, what I call a V-shaped recovery of the Indian economy to take the last point which you, which you mentioned. And I think that this recovery is likely to be sustainable. But before I comment on anything on that sustainable, First of all, I totally agree with Rish that uh, looking at COP26, uh, the first dominant concern, and uh, yes, uh, Kerry was here. He met all the relevant interlocutors. Uh, uh, before that, uh, the uh, Environment uh, Secretary uh, uh, Sharma was here. He met me also and discussed the stuff. So I think Rish is absolutely uh, right that the issue of uh, 
the unfulfilled commitment of 100 billion seems to haunt us. And in some manner, this needs to be addressed, which addresses the historic legacy concerns of developing economies like India, of uh, the huge amount of ozone layer already occupied, uh, the issues of climate uh, uh, justice and so on. Uh, but I think that if we address this issue, we can get out of the trap of these legacy issues. Why? Because I totally agree that it is high up on the agenda. Never before uh, uh, has the issues uh, been so high up. Never before has been such an enormous opportunity of making this uh, economically viable and affordable. I think that in that sense, this COP26 is taking place in a much more favorable environment, notwithstanding uh, uh, the pandemic, than any other earlier COP, because the affordability and availability of technologies which make these commercially viable. I will make two more, very three very brief comments and stop. Uh, first, because technology is a great equalizer, but it's also a great divider, because as was rightly pointed out, uh, that India coped with this huge uh, pandemic. We did not allow our education systems to be disrupted because of online education for children. And yet, because of the lack of availability of electricity, a lot of people were left out of this mainstream, which accentuated the inequality in a country of India's side. I think that one of the questions which was posed was that have more people gone back into extreme poverty uh, than ever before on account of the pandemic? And technology is a unifier, but technology can also be a divider. So I think as I look forward, how does one harness technology in a manner which makes it for build back better, more inclusive, more equitable build back? And I think that some of the panelists who have pointed out on this have done. The second point, which I agree entirely, that we may have to live for fossil fuel for longer than we think. The issue would be, what is the most non-disruptive path as we embrace the renewable technology? Now, we need to have a combination of the two. A lot of livelihood, a lot of human life has been built around fossil fuel. And as we transit to an era, of uh, renewable fuels, transit to an era of green fuels, uh, we need to see uh, the least disruptive part, which is uh, for a large country of 1.2 billion size of India, uh, difficult. One last point and I'll stop. I entirely agree with you, Boshe, that uh, whereas public outlay is important, and that's where I think that some of the support for multilateral organizations and uh, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, uh, the what has been done for by way of public outlays, this additional finance is important. But we need to find a way of how does one crowd in private capital. Now, some of India's leading firms, some of which the Excellency Finance Minister may be aware of, have taken some far-reaching steps in, in risky large investments on uh, green hydrogen energy, on storage systems, on transportation systems, and how does the regulatory framework in our countries begin to crowd in private investment? And a lot of the success of COP26 will depend on the ability to harmonize the relationship between public-private partnership, which is mutually beneficial. Thank you, Boshi. No, thank you so much, uh, NK. Um, extremely um, important input. I would like to go back to you, uh, Minister uh, Jadan. Uh, you heard NK uh, Singh here talking about a V-shaped recovery. Sometimes I feel we are like in a W-shaped uh, recovery uh, because of uh, the pandemic. And as you also uh, mentioned uh, initially, uh, it has uh, not been a recovery that is uh, distributed uh, the same way uh, all over the world. For example, on the stimulus, uh, the 13, 14 trillion US dollars, only 2% of the stimulus has gone to developing nations. 
And as we know, uh, in the continent next uh, to Saudi Arabia, Africa, only 2 to 3% of the population uh, is uh, vaccinated. And we have, for the first time in two decades, seen that there are now 100 million more people that uh, became uh, in the category of extreme poor uh, this uh, year. So uh, the development issues are really, really uh, challenging. At the same time, we know that uh, climate change is also uh, playing a role here. We have the run-up uh, to uh, the COP26, but at the same time, we know also there is energy uh, poverty in the world, as I mentioned in my question uh, to, to Vicky. So uh, it is a really a challenging uh, landscape here, and how uh, will uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia um, deal uh, with this and what's your policies now in the run-up to the COP26, the MC12, the trade minister meeting, and also uh, the upcoming meetings in G20. Thank you again. Uh, I, I was really, really uh, pleased to hear um, my colleagues in the panel. I think they bring about very, very important points, uh, particularly, uh, Borge, um, two key elements. One is I think if we, um, possibly you said it before me, if we stop talking and do, I think we will achieve a lot more. Um, uh, I could tell you in terms of recovery, it is possibly not necessarily V-shape or over, or not necessarily W or over, possibly even K-shape, where certain economies will become, despite the difficulties, but others are going to struggle and struggle big time. In Saudi, I could tell you while uh, we have limited resources, we have contributed, uh, when I compare just as a Minister of Finance, how much I allocated to the vaccine in Saudi Arabia compared to how much we actually uh, donated for the COVID-19, particularly for vaccine development and distribution. Uh, if you look at the size, it's about 20%. So we actually spent 20% supporting the world health um, recovery, particularly in the low-income countries, compared to how much I paid for vaccines in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think the second point, it's an argument that we had, if you remember, last year uh, during our presidency, and earlier this year with the G20 and then with the IMF is for the special drawing rights. And I tried to lobby saying, actually, now we have an opportunity. So it is out of politics. You don't need to go to your parliament to allocate funds from your own budget. You will be given free money. So why are we giving, to, giving it to countries and then expecting them to give it back to low-income countries? Why can't we allocate 50, 100, 150 billion out of the 650. And basically give it to the multilateral institutions and say, this is our insurance policy for low-income countries to recover. This is what we are going to do to help these countries. Unfortunately, that did not happen. I would still argue, and I'm encouraging my colleagues in the G20 to do something about this uh, and to make sure that we all, with the private sector, contribute to the equitable recovery out of this very difficult crisis. I would like to comment just on a couple of points, Borge, that were mentioned, in particular in relation to energy. And in that point, I think we are possibly kidding ourselves if we think that clean energy is the solution in the short term and the term. Clean energy is very important and renewables are extremely important. Saudi Arabia is actually investing tens of billions of dollars on, on renewables, and it is 50% of our energy mix, even though we are, we are the most um, exporters of oil. But that alone is not going to be uh, enough. And we have seen, and we should learn from what's happening in Europe today about the prices. We should literally, literally learn that even electric vehicles charging stations being stopped during the daytime because there isn't enough energy. So we need to work on research and development. We need to work on how we are going to develop technologies that would help us capture, reuse, or remove uh, 
uh, emissions. Thank you. Uh, uh, Vicky, you heard what uh, Minister Jadan just uh, said now on the energy prices. Uh, first, uh, the price of oil and gas has gone up. And here in Europe, in the middle of uh, Europe, we're seeing uh, no electricity prices and gas prices we haven't uh, seen for decades. And there is no a lot of political pressure also on the leaders here. And at the same time, we know uh, that we're running up to uh, COP26. Uh, Are we currently uh, seeing a global situation that there is a huge underinvesting uh, in energy? Do you think we will have an energy security access uh, crisis? And how do we deal with this at the same time as we have to get down uh, the CO2 emissions? It seems uh, like catch-22. I definitely believe that's a risk because if you look at the oil and gas industry and you look at the exploration that used to drive our, our, our industry in terms of developing new resources and finding new resources that can um, provide the meat demand in the future, that exploration dollars are, are about 10% of what they were at the height of our industry. So exploration uh, essentially is now a very, very, very small part of our industry investment. So without exploration, that means you have to get the most out of the reservoirs that you have today. And, um, and that's one of the, the, one of the premises of, a, of many models is that the lower cost emissions will be those that come from existing reservoirs. And that will not only help to, um, to meet the, the growing uh, challenge of meeting uh, the world's future oil and gas demands um, with lower investment, it will also do it in a lower intensive uh, way from a, an emission standpoint. And so that's why we're really pushing and, and trying to ensure that carbon capture use and sequestration is a part of the solution to what's happening uh, with the energy in industry today, the oil and gas industry. Um, with fewer people developing new, new reserves, it's going to be uh, critical that using uh, carbon uh, capture use and sequestration not only help us to generate and get more reserves out of the ground today. In fact, we can, in some cases in the, in the shale reservoirs, we can double recovery with uh, CO2 enhanced oil recovery using anthropogenic CO2 from industry and CO2 directly from the air. And every time we cycle through CO2, a portion of that CO2, 40% stays sequestered in the reservoirs, so it does help with sequestration. It also takes more CO2 injected into an oil reservoir than the barrel of oil that's produced from that injection generates when it's used. So combined with, um, with emission-free power, we can, and, and direct air capture, uh, anthropogenic uh, capture, the CCUS that we can do today will provide also lower carbon, uh, net neutral or net zero, um, carbon uh, oil to aviation and maritime industries. And those are the industries that most need the help with becoming carbon neutral over time. So while I think that we're underinvested, I think that we have this very unique opportunity in the world that we can create more investment and generate the uh, oil that the world needs and by, while lowering emissions in the process, providing uh, lower carbon or carbon neutral oil to aviation and maritime. And we're also developing a technology that goes along with that, which is a, an emission-free power generation uh, technology. What it does is, as a part of the process of generating lower cost electricity than traditional ways uh, that are used today, um, it, uh, in producing that electricity, generates a pure stream of CO2 that can then be uh, sequestered without needing retrofitting. It's a, it's a part of the construction and the process, and it's called net power. So those are um, technologies that need to be advanced in lieu of spending a lot more dollars to go and explore and, and um, develop new reserves in the world. And so we're, we're doing that, and I know others are, are looking at doing that too, and I think that's how our industry helps with the transition. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rich Lesser. Uh, we really need uh, someone as thoughtful as you and BCG to help us here now, because I, in a way, see a triangle here. It's access to energy, then there is energy security, 
But then there is the question of like all this energy also has to be decoupled from increased CO2 emissions or we have to have the te technology of carbon capture, storage and uh, sequestration. But we're not moving uh, into a situation that that is really happening because that has also to be incentivized. So do you see any uh, end of this uh, impasse? Is it possible to break it? It's possible. But it's going to be a challenge, which is why we're going to need to work collaboratively across traditional boundaries to do it. If I go back to Minister Singh's comments, it really just struck me the, the challenge of this, because on the one hand, he's right, completely right, about how disruptive this could be to economies that are already fragile in parts of the world where people are just emerging from poverty or many still in poverty and to take this on. And the flip side is that the failure to act aggressively and boldly in the short term will hurt those exact same populations and future generations probably the most severely through disruption to food systems, through vulnerable populations in coastal areas or facing severe weather events, through just the flat out heat because many of lower and middle income countries are just closer to the equator and their citizens will suffer as heat rises to levels that probably most of us would think are, are barely livable. And, and, and so, so we're in this challenge where you can't help but feel empathy for the pressures that officials feel, government officials, and, and from their citizens. And we see it even in the developed world, as you were saying, people reacting to high energy prices, the, the yellow vest situation. So, so like, I, I, we have to start with empathy and understanding, but we also have to recognize that failure to act boldly puts enormous vulnerability under huge stretches of humanity, and often those who will least be able to react in effective ways to it. So what does that mean? That means first that we have to take it on as a global challenge, as I said earlier, where the developed world feels a responsibility to help uh, low and middle income countries to move faster. Second, we have to realize that every single thing we do in technology to bring down the cost of this transition will pay for itself many times over because one, it is extraordinarily expensive and two, it'll, it'll change the trade-off curve for many others where this trade-off is enormously expensive. So all the investments we make in technology, whether it's in renewables, whether it's in carbon capture, whether it's in technologies that are out of favor like nuclear right now, but will maybe in, maybe not in all parts of the world, but in some parts of the world will be an important part of the solution. And whether it's in all the work that the downstream users of carbon put into their supply chains to help them decarbonize, to pay and invest in their businesses to encourage that, those things are gonna be very important. What I've been encouraged by is, I think the business community in ways that George and Vicky expressed far better than I could, and but on many different parts of the economy are stepping forward to be bolder. I think many governments realize the urgency here, but they're, they're under big challenges, a pandemic, not the least of that for sure. Um, and, and the more we can get cooperation between governments to set bolder ambitions and business and government to work collaboratively to spur those investments, to protect the people that move first, to um, uh, encourage uh, changes in behavior from business, I think we're likely to get there at a better pace. And if we don't, the suffering is going to be very high. No, thank you, uh, Rich. Uh, George, maybe a short comment from you. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I agree with Rich relative to technology innovation being a really a big part of the solution. And what I'm seeing, especially in our space, that it does require more innovative uh, approaches to how we go to market also, that the traditional ways that buildings were served and the, the cost and, and the lack of efficiency um, has, has really been highlighted now as we go through this cycle. And Getting back to this public-private partnerships, we believe in, for instance, with, with buildings being such a big part of the carbon footprint, how do we be innovative in creating an output that instead of the, the traditional approach to building and maintaining a, a building, how do you create an output that actually can be, be, be financed and the, re, the output that's actually being created is creating a return um, as a result? And when we look at the tight economic conditions, whether it be you know, public sector entities, including schools, hospitals, government agencies, they stretch for 
for dollars to construct new facilities, maintain existing ones, and without the you know, necessary resources, they're delayed, and then therefore it delays the ability to be able to get the efficiency that we believe can be achieved in buildings. And so the way that we, when we, you look at the trillions in additional investment uh, that's gonna be needed in, in carbon cutting technology, and ultimately the projects and services that are gonna be required to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Accord, we believe the, the smart regulations combined with technology and innovation, not only in the technology around renewables, but also as we're looking at the solution sets that are critical to being able to create the outputs within buildings, the two combined can ultimately not only create econ economic return, significantly reduce the carbon, and at the same time focusing the return on developing the workforce that we believe from an economic standpoint is, is gonna be a big deal, especially in these developing uh, communities. Thank you, Josh. Uh, N.K. Uh, Singh, we know that uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, is heading to New York. He's going to participate at the uh, UNGA this year. He hasn't frequently uh, gone, but this year he is. And I think he's also meeting with President Biden uh, on uh, Friday. And I guess one of the topics that you will touch on is um, COP26, energy, uh, environment but I guess also uh, the broader picture about an inclusive uh, recovery and also the more geopolitical um, challenges uh, that we are uh, seeing uh, just uh, currently. So it would be very interesting because I know you're very close to the Prime Minister uh, to hear a little bit of the current thinking and zeitgeist in Delhi now. Well, I, I, I think that uh... First of all, I share most of the comments made by many of the panelists. I totally agree with the Excellency, the Finance Minister, that the uh, innovative ways must be found like the somewhat inclusive, broad-based SDR allocation, uh, which doesn't leave out and exclude countries. And I think that getting multilaterals in the picture would be of enormous, uh, would be of enormous help. And I think that, Rich, as usual, I, I cannot uh, refrain from making one observation that I totally agree with you, Rich, when you say that uh, this whole issue of disruption and the issue of disruption in a country like India, uh, pockets of fossil fuel, where millions of people are engaged, also happen to be the poorest part of the country. So a non-disruptive transition on fossil fuel, which minimizes human cost, and doesn't accentuate the poverty syndrome is one of the challenges which the leadership uh, is having to grapple. Uh, I think that, uh, Ojea, you raised the issue of how do I see the prime minister's uh, visit? Well, the prime minister knows very well uh, the fact that he has gone on record so many times to emphasize what a centerpiece uh, this issue is. Just take uh, three recent announcements that is going to build on that. So that's partly will uh, Bershir reflect. He chose the occasion of India's uh, 75th independence to announce a special green hydrogen mission. That embeds a lot. Uh, a special green hydrogen mission. It right? encourage public outlay. It encourage Ghana private investment. It encourage gainful circles. So we will emphasize the hydrogen, global hydrogen alliance, uh, green hydrogen alliance, as one of the areas building on his 75th uh, Independence uh, Day address. The second, as a signal of transit, he did one of the critical users of fossil fuel in India, and is a India's largest public sector undertaking, uh, which has captive coal mines, which has lots of captive stuff, is the Indian Railways, with which uh, I don't know uh, how many of the, this very distinguished panelists have traveled on the Indian railways, but there are some uh, uh, good in, in features of Indian railways. He has openly committed to make the Indian railways net zero. This is a very powerful signal that India's public sector undertakings, which will therefore naturally include steel, uh, big investments there, it includes coal, if the most important public enterprise, which is railways, is going to be net zero, 
It's a target which seeks to extend his commitment in Paris of achieving certain levels uh, while giving leadership to the Solar Alliance to extend that in terms of energy efficiency and moving towards uh, uses of greater technology. But the one point which I think that I, 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 he's certainly going to emphasize, uh, given what he has been saying, is the role of public-private partnership in harnessing affordable technology and making technology access. So I think that the criticality of the role of private capital and what is the kind of an enabling regulatory framework which are now crowding in of private capital is going to be one of the themes and messages. Yes, of course, I don't want to comment on it. Uh, geopolitics will also be uh, on his mind but right now, uh, given as we are under your uh, moderatorship, shaping equitable, inclusive, sustainable growth, I have uh, restricted my remarks on some of the issues which have been raised. One final comment, if I might. I think on issues of fiscal policy, and I think that the recovery process, if it is rapid enough, provides every country the room for much greater maneuverability on higher public outlays without compromising the framework of macroeconomic stability to which levels of sustainable debt and levels of fiscal deficit are centerpiece of that strategy. Certainly that is true, but this is a time of not only transition from the pandemic, but a transition to an era of renewable energy. It's a time of fiscal forbearance and not fiscal rectitude. And therefore, the room for fiscal policy, sovereigns must view with flexibility, which the compelling needs of the time need. Thank you so much, N.K. Um, moving back to you, uh, Mr. Uh, Jadan, we're coming uh, close to an end there. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your last uh, intervention that uh, we might not be faced with a V-shaped or a W-shaped uh, recovery, but maybe a K. Something is going up and something is going down. Of course, that is uh, concerning if what's going down is the developing uh, economies and what's going up is, is the developed uh, world. So then we will see increased um, inequalities uh, in the world. But what would be very interesting, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but you have very um, smart economists uh, around you there. Where do you feel that uh, the economy uh, are going to end up in two to three uh, years? Are you uh, bullish or bearish? Thank you, Borge. I think two things. One is I am actually very optimistic. I think we will have generally, generally a very good recovery um, over the next two or three years. I could tell you in Saudi Arabia, we um, are working uh, very hard to complement our vision 2030. And uh, most likely, uh, the way things are working is uh, we are going to have a very healthy recovery. And I think most of the world will have that we need to watch out for low-income countries. We need to watch out for, uh, you know, emerging markets that really, really requires help. Uh, and that should not be um, really ignored in any way, shape, or form. I think one thing that we um, talked about and I would like just to, to comment on very quickly, possibly a few seconds, is if you look at some of the technologies that are now being applied. Um, they, I mean, in, I'll tell you in Saudi Arabia, we have we had two investments, large investments that we have doing. One in government buildings, <coughs> where we are actually contracting private sector to replace all the energy um, consuming tools, particularly lights, some of the ACs, and what we are paying them, we are not paying them anything. We are basically paying them part of the electricity bill, the difference between the two electricity bill before and after for five years, some of them for seven years. So it is just amazing what you could do um, when you have the will to, to apply technology and involve uh, the private sector. The same we are doing with diesel units where we are replacing uh, liquid uh, fuel diesel with either renewables or gas, and we are recovering the capital um, for replacing the whole unit in about 20 months. 
So if you think, and if you have the will, I think you have the means uh, all over. Thank you. Shukran, a uh, short comment uh, from you, uh, Rich Lesser, and then I'll uh, go uh, for the closing. We should be on time. Rich. Um, thank you. Just, I just wanted to come back to Minister Singh's comments. I thought it was so important. This concept of a just transition and what do we do at both the micro level? There's a very interesting effort I've been close to at the Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican about how to develop frameworks for companies to follow on just transitions, because we're all going to be changing our business models that could hurt workers, could hurt communities, could make it that much more difficult. And how do we, at that level, think about involving communities, involving our workforces, thinking about what other ways we can do to bridge this very challenging transition ahead. And second, how capital comes to bear on that. Um, uh, Bill Gates just announced a big uh, program uh, with Breakthrough Energies this morning that we'll be a part of on how do you invest capital with low return mindset, not to generate high returns, but to create the technologies that will help everyone, which I think Minister Singh also highlighted. And I just thought those two points were really important and worth amplifying. Thank you uh, so uh, much. Uh, it's been a great panel. I learned a lot. I think uh, we all gained uh, insight. I would have loved to uh, continue another half an hour. And then I learned that's the time when you should cut the panel, when everyone wants it to still continue. So uh, really great input from all the panelists. We touched on uh, energy access, energy security. We also touched on uh, decoupling. Uh, we also touched on how we can secure a more uh, inclusive and job-creating uh, recovery. We didn't conclude if it was a WK or a V-shaped recovery, but I'm uh, uh, then leaning towards uh, what Minister Jadan said. He is optimistic on medium term that we will see uh, growth back in the global uh, economy. So. Thank you all for joining, and I couldn't think of a better start of our first day of our summit. So, special thank you to a great panel. Thank you so much.